Hi there. This is a um, this is Rihanna Wright. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ranton Wright, and I want to talk to you today about a book. Please don't run, books are fun. And I just want to let you know about a good one that I think you'll enjoy, and I thoroughly enjoyed, so I hope you will as well, if you want to check it out. The book is called A Love Letter to Africville, and it's by Amanda Carvery Taylor. And the forward is by Dr. Claudine Bonner. And this is what the book looks like. Sorry for the reflection on it, but beautiful book. It is a picture book, I would say, but it has, it, there's definitely stories in it to read. As you'll see, it has pictures of descendants or people that were from, well, people that were from Africville. And then there's descendants as well that are featured in the book. Beautiful photography done by Amanda. And as you can see, some of the photos here, very beautifully done. And then each participant that had their photo done, they did a little write-up or story about their time. All very touching, um, really lets you get a feel for Africville and what it was like growing up there and living there. Definitely a circumstance I wish I personally had an opportunity to know. I personally grew up in a majority white neighborhood, went to majority white schools, so I don't didn't get that feeling of black community. Iowa has ex definitely exposed to black communities, like I was babysat in Cherry Brook. I hung a lot in Mo um, in Uniac Square. I was had a membership at the George Dixon Center. So it was like I, I definitely had my involvement in the black community. So this sense of community of coming home after school and your aunts and uncles are around and your cousins there and whomever, I never got that. It's back to this beautifully, wonderfully written, wonderfully composed and put together book. Um, I'm gonna read you guys a little section of the book and this is gonna be, I'm gonna actually be interviewing the person later on in this video. It's Elaine Carvery Wright. So it goes, I remember living with my grandmother before my mother got her own house. When we moved from my grandmother's house, we moved to the top of the hill, an area in Africville. In March, the winds were so strong. If I stood outside, I felt like I could fly. I would come home from school and see my mother hanging clothes outside on the clothesline to dry. It took all day to do the dishes. My mother and sister would tease me for taking so long, but I didn't care. I would sing away while I washed dishes. I would empty the dishwasher in bushes and sing to the bushes, pretending they were my audience. I would tell them, it's okay, you don't have to clap. We used to go swimming and all the rocks had names. One was called the chair because it was shaped like a chair and another was called the big rock. We learned to swim by the shore first and when we got better, we could swim out to the chair and play there. If you were a really good swimmer, you got to swim to the big rock. And that's when you were big time. You could dive and swim underwater. But I never made it to the big rock. I still had fun playing with jellyfish and didn't have a care in the world. We never even got stung. I lived dangerously in Africville, picking gems up on the train tracks. They were just rocks and sand pieces from the trains but I'd say they were my diamonds. So much of my childhood was just playing and having fun. Well, my, that sounds quite delightful, doesn't it? Doesn't Africa sound like a beautiful place to live in? Not like this rundown slum land that the government led us to believe it was, that they led the population of Halifax to believe it was to justify it being torn down and decimated into nothing and made into a park where dogs could freely shit. So here's the pictures that were done of Elaine in the book. Sorry, I apologize for the reflective properties on the page from the light. But yeah, some beautiful pictures, some candid shots. Um, yeah, that was her story. 
And there are many other people in here, but I'm just highlighting her story because we are going to be speaking with her later on. Everyone has a little excerpt, their photos and so forth. And it, the story is extremely touching. Like it's no one person's individual story, but the collective and the collection of those stories, it's like, it was just really touching. I. Couldn't, I didn't even get past the forward before tears started running down my eyes. It was so beautifully written and I... So the very end, Amanda writes a Dear Africville love letter. I couldn't even... I had to take new, like multiple breaks because the tears and the snot, sorry to, if it's too much information, but yeah, the tears would not stop rolling down my face. Like I couldn't... I couldn't get through it without running for Kleenex till eventually I just brought a box of Kleenex over to where I was seated because that made more sense. This book is definitely um, a needed addition to anyone who loves photography, who anyone who just loves historical stories, to anyone who just wants to hear about something that maybe they didn't know about. But for those of you who don't know anything about Africville, I'm just going to give you, take a moment to give you a brief history on Africville. The following information can be found on the Canadian Encyclopedia.ca in an article by John Tatry. In the mid-19th century, Africville was an African-Canadian settlement located north of Halifax. For many, Africville represents the oppression faced by black Canadians as the city of Halifax wiped out the thriving seaside community in the 1960s. Africville was originally occupied in 1761 by numerous white families, comprising of those of whom imported and sold enslaved African men and women. It is said that the area was later given the nickname African Village due to the number of black families living in the area. The black families consisted of black refugees from the War of 1812, former slaves, and of Maroons. Black settlers William Brown and William Arnold acquired land in Africville in 1848. This was to be the beginning of other black families following suit and Seaview African United Baptist Church was later established in 1849. Africville can be remembered for being a safe haven from the anti-black racism faced by many black people in Halifax. The residents owned an assortment of businesses, including farms and stores. Black people were extremely limited to the work they were allowed to obtain in the city of Halifax, with many jobs being those of domestic servants. Even though the city of Halifax collected taxes from the residents of Africville, the city of Halifax refused to provide basic services such as paved roads, running water, or sewers. Municipal services including such things as police protection, garbage collection, public transportation were absent in Africville. Following the expropriation of land for the railway in the first half of the 19th century, the city of Halifax in the second half of the 19th century decided to place adverse services in Africville, including an infectious disease hospital, fertilizer plant, rockhead prison, human waste pits, slaughterhouses, and an open pit garbage dump. The residents of Africville actively petitioned the city of Halifax to provide municipal services such as running water, sewage disposal, paved roads, garbage removal, electricity, street lights, police services, and a cemetery. Due to the way in which the city of Halifax treated the residents of Africville, many white Halifax residents referred to Africville as a slum built around the dump by scavengers. Although Africville was referred to as a slum, the people of the settlement continued to thrive. The preachers and the music from Seaview African United Baptist Church were renowned and celebrated by many, from within and outside of the community alike. Other accomplishments connected to Africville would include the first black boxing world champion, George Dixon, who was from Africville. The Africville Brown Bombers were a popular team in the Colored Hockey League of the Maritimes. The famous Nova Scotian singer Portia White worked as a school teacher in Africville as well, just to name a few. In 1956 and 1957, the city of Halifax recommended rehousing residents to make way for industrial projects. 
The city approved plans that would run over Africville for an expressway to downtown Halifax in 1962. However, this was never built. In 1962, 100 residents from Africville voted against moving, wishing to instead improve the existing community. In the end, the city of Halifax voted to remove the residents of Africville with the promise of improved housing. In 1964, the first land in Africville was expropriated. Over the next five years, homes were bulldozed lot by lot. As if losing one's home wasn't already enough, many residents were forced to be moved using city dump trucks. Many residents were given only a few hours warning that their home was to be demolished, while others returned to see their home and all of their possessions bulldozed to the ground. In the spring of 1967, the Seaview United Baptist Church was destroyed in the middle of the night. The final property was expropriated and demolished in 1969. Many residents were not adequately compensated for the value of their land. Many families ended up spread throughout the country as relocating was now a necessity for survival. The city of Halifax eventually made the land into an off-leash dog park, mainly used by the city's white residents. Halifax Regional Municipality Mayor Peter Kelly, on the 24th of February 2010, apologized for the destruction of Africville. A replica church was built and made into a museum in 2012, and the area was renamed Africville Park. Welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that and learning about Africville. If you didn't already, if you weren't already aware and didn't know about Africville, it's quite a great place, quite a historical event of what happened there and what continues to go without retribution. Although the descendants and the people from Africville continue to fight and exercise their right to be treated correctly and to have those wrongs righted, they have yet to be righted. They were built a replica church, but you can say what you want, but I believe that's not sufficient. My belief is that the majority of people from Africville and the descendants benefited nothing. They benefited absolutely zero from what was done. While others are pretty comfortable, most are not. However, as a collective, that's why unity is so important in the community. And building a replica of a church that is a museum that the descendants have to actually pay money to go in and see the museum doesn't really sit well with me. Doesn't sound like anyone really thought that out. Thanks for remaining with us throughout this educational journey. And I hope that you're enjoying what you're watching so far. So now you see we're joined with Elaine. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, uh, you're welcome. It's great to see you. Yeah. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Well, of course. After reading your excellent write-up yeah. in Amanda's book, we definitely mm -hmm. had to get an opportunity to get you in here to talk to us. I do have a few questions for you. It shouldn't be too long of an interview. Okay. And I hope you're ready. Yeah, hope so. Elaine, please explain to us, how did you become involved in Amanda's book? Well, I'm from Africa, so she asked me if I'd participate in her book. She said, let's uh, set up a meeting. And we met in Africa Phil at the uh, Africa Phil Museum in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And we chatted and it was, we had, you know, brought back memories and we had like a nice time in remembering things from Africville and even things that I've forgotten came back to me and I said sure Amanda I would love to take part in your book. And you would say it was a great experience? Oh for sure yeah it was yes. You were born in Africville correct? Yes. And you lived there until what age? 15. So tell me about your early days of living in Africville what was it like? It was nice normal uh, I was lived with my family. It was like uh, uh, getting up every day and pretty much go going out to play and being with my friends and neighbors. And we just, I just, I enjoyed, you know, know, the fact that we, I knew everyone in my neighborhood. And we were just all family. And you mentioned in the book that you lived with your grandmother initially. We, uh, I lived at my grandmother's house. Well, at that time I was. An infant, and my grandmother died shortly after that. And we lived there till I was about five, 
and then we moved to up, what we called Up the Hill. And what was Up the Hill? It was uh, just a hill that you, another level of Africville. Like we lived right on the area that we call Barrington Street. My grandparents' house was on the area that we call Barrington Street. Then we moved a level up, up on like up the hill, and then uh, I was about five, and I can remember moving there, and it was real. That was an exciting day for me moving, and uh, shortly after that, I think after that, that's when I started school from after we moved. And what was so exciting about moving? Uh, just new house and getting new furniture, and it just was different, something different, and just a different a change. So tell me about your mother. What was she like? Well, she was kind, loving, caring, and she was a, a great mother. What was her name? Myrtle Carvery. And your mother is now passed away? Yes. And when did she pass away? Uh, 36 years ago. Do you remember what you were doing 37. in that moment when you found out? Yeah, I was home. Yeah, well, we spent when she was in the hospital, we spent our evenings and mornings at the hospital. And we just came home for a rest. And then, I think it was my niece that called me and said that mom was gone. And so we, my husband and I, we rushed out of bed and got ready to go to the hospital to, be, to see my mother. And yeah, it was sad. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm. She sounds like an amazing person. Yeah, she was. Yeah. In Amanda's book, you spoke about swimming. So you learned to swim at a young age? Uh, for an Africville person, you know, it wasn't a young age. I was old, actually. <laughs> How old were you? I was like, probably, I'll say I was like nine or ten. And usually, like, kids from, the children from Africville, like, we took the water, like fish. But I was a little slow at it. My, my, some of my other friends, we, we started out together, but they, meant, they made it to the chair and I was still on the shore. Explain what the chair was. That was a rock that was shaped like a chair and the kids jumped off that rock and sometimes dove off. It depended on how, if the tide wasn't high enough, you could dive but a little bit, but I don't know, do belly flops for me. <laughs> Explain what are some other activities you enjoyed doing when you were a kid in Africville? We played, oh, hide and seek was fun. We did that, and the water fights were really good. We liked it, having water fights, and um, oh, making mud pies, and going to the bushes and picking blueberries, and then wild pears. It was fun, and we used to roll tires down the street or through the neighborhood, seeing whose tire would go the fastest and the furthest. One of my friends, he played the guitar, and we would get together down near Barrington Street and he would play the guitar and a bunch of kids we'd get there we would, he would play and we would sing and that was fun that was, we had fun doing that that does sound fun mm -hmm. and tell me a little about the food in Africville well usually the, well during the week I ate like regular what I would say but one Sunday it would be a roast the next Sunday it would be a boiled dinner yeah and you guys ate dinner as a family usually if we, but sometimes if we're all playing and we're occupied with our friends, and sometimes you know you didn't have to worry about going home for dinner. Or you go home sometimes had dinner with your friend's family, and we're, if you were playing with someone, you just hey, and they were serving up dinner or supper, and we just ate together, and ate with them. I would eat with my friends or whatever. And what were the holidays like concerning food? Good. There's lots of food, treats. What did you guys eat? Baking. Depends on, well, usually like Christmas, turkey, Easter, ham, Thanksgiving, turkey, mm, mashed potatoes and squash and turnip and all the, all the dressings and chow chow. Back then, cranberries, that was usually homemade. Yeah, I'm getting hungry now just thinking about it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So a big part of Africville was the sense of community, the sense of safety, right, yes. of living around your family, mm -hmm. everyone knowing each other. Right. Yes. Yeah. So how would you compare that to where you live now? Oh my, it's drastic difference. 
neighbors move in and out and you don't get to know your neighbors sometimes they speak and I find also that if I see a neighbor in a at the grocery store at the mall I don't recognize them because of, I'm used to I only just see them like cross the street or cross the driveway so seeing them up closer in a different environment you barely recognize them people are so mobile that there's just a few people that's been in the neighborhood as long as I've been here. So people are really transient. So you would say there isn't really much of a sense of community? No, I, not really. No. But I, and neighbors aren't generally that close? Like they're nice to each other, but not yeah, close? It, yeah, they're nice. Everyone's nice and speaks. And sometimes uh, in the winter, a neighbor will come with their snowblower and help us out. Or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah that's when you, I find in the winter, that's when you, most of the time you get to see your neighbors because everyone's out shoveling snow. And someone like me who didn't get to grow up in a community like Africaville, do you think I could have benefited from such an experience? Oh, for sure, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest part is knowing your relatives. Now, now these days, you don't, people don't know their relatives. It's relatives that you haven't even met, like nieces and nephews. Uh, some of them, their children, you haven't met them. You, you know, if you saw them, you wouldn't know them. And your family is like scattered and friends that, people I grew up with, I said I thought I'd always be around them my whole life. And now I don't, some of them I don't ever see, some I see once in a, once a year at the reunion and it's, it's really different and you really miss people. And how do you feel since COVID that the reunion hasn't been happening? Well, I feel a great sense of loss because that was my highlight of the year. So I really miss that. I miss seeing maybe one. I have a few questions that popped into my head after reading Amanda's book. So there's just, just some things I'm personally interested in. Can you tell me about what is Big Town? Or what was Big Town? That was just uh, like sections of uh, Arrival. Didn't have like street names, but we have like area names. So if you say I was in Big Town, you would know who lived there in that area. You would know what part of Africa you were in. And as for a group called the Raindrops, can you tell me who they were? They were a group of uh, young guys that got together and uh, formed a group and they were really talented. And they did good. What's a gramophone? Oh, that would be a record player with a thing shaped like a horn, the needle one it was shaped something like a horn. Oh, I can picture it from like a movie. <laughs> did you wind it or anything? How did it play? Was it plugged in? One of them was plugged in. Some of them were wind, the wind-up ones. And I remember when my um, my aunt and uncle had one, and that was it was really fun. We used to have yard. It, that was the wind-up one, and we used to have fun, have yard dances, and that was quite fun. That was a lot of fun. Everyone getting together and out in my aunt and uncle's yard, dancing and having a good time. So here we see a feature of you in a free local publication called The Coast. Tell us what this was about and how you ended up getting involved. Well, that was at an Africville reunion and people, were, uh, people from different newspapers and reporters, usually every year this happens that they come about interviewing people, taking pictures and questioning them. I don't remember, it's been a long time, but I don't remember being interviewed. Like, people would just take your pictures and like being on Africville, your, your picture or could show up anywhere. It was like, uh, some, your pictures were taken, some your, people would take your picture and you didn't know what, that they, your picture was being taken. And then you could see it in a, in a post or different papers or whatever. But as for this paper in the coast, you were or were not aware that they were going to put your picture in it? No, I was, it was a surprise. A lot, a lot of times you see yourself, if that, when that happens, you're surprised. And how does that make you feel? You're happy to see yourself? I'm happy that uh, Africville is being made aware of and that people know that we're still, we still exist. We're still here. You lived in Africville when it was torn down? Yes, not? I did. And what was it like seeing your community torn down? Uh, it was uh, heartbreaking. Yeah, it was hurtful. And my friends were going, leaving, and 
we were one of the last fam families to leave. And that was like, and then after a while it was, uh, you couldn't go out. After, after dark, you couldn't go out. And uh, for some reason the city, uh, they uh, took all the lights, the power from the power, street lights and things, they took those out. And so we were like, when the sun went down and it got dark, we were in total darkness other than that, what was in your house. And, and there wasn't many neighbors, so you couldn't go anywhere. You wouldn't go out anymore. There wasn't very many places to go anyway. Only a few people were there. So when the sun went down, you were, there, you were in the dark. And, there, and if you had to go into the city, you had to be home before it got dark because it was like you couldn't see your hand before you if you were walking down the hill or walking to your house. You may not find your way home. Oh my God. That, yeah, that was. I, when I think about that right now, it's scary. And what was going through your mind initially when you found out you had to move? Do you remember? Well, at that point, I was like being a teenager. Yeah, I didn't realize the situation, what, what was happening. But the, I, I was like kind of excited to join my friends and family that I had already moved from Africa. So I was looking forward to living near them and being able to be around them whenever I wanted to. In your opinion, what do you believe would constitute retribution for what was done to the community of Africaville and its people? My opinion, the least that would compensate us would be a house for a house. That's the, the least, I, I believe that would be the least that we could, that they could do for us. But there's lots more that could be done. But I feel like uh, <clears throat> we were denied uh, in our inheritance that was stolen for, from us because I really feel that we were robbed of uh, what our future could be, could, have, could be right now because we had to settle for what uh, the city said, what they gave us. Oh, most mm -hmm. definitely. The people of mm -hmm. Africa were definitely robbed yeah. and definitely <clears throat> nothing has been done to make that right. Mm -hmm. They have done a few things to try to make it right. What's your opinion on the replica of the church? Did that make anything right? No. I don't feel it made uh, anything right. So who was that to benefit? Who do you think? No one uh, that I know of. Unless, uh, because it's so s small that you can hold events in there, in it, big events, and it's, uh, wow. To me, it's just, uh, that was like a waste of money, actually, because I think we should have had a big venue, a place that where a church that you could go to and have church, or a place where you could go and have weddings and s celebrations. Like, uh, so when we go to Af the reunions, we have to still have to set up a big tent so that everyone can go in and have, ch uh, have church. To have church, we have to set up a tent because you can't fit uh, enough, well, only like, uh, I don't know if you can get 25, 35 people in that comfortably in there. And so I, I feel like it's, it may, it, it may benefit a few people, but the majority, no. Well, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today, Elaine. Definitely appreciate it. It was great talking to you. You really came with a lot of insight. I feel like I know a lot more about Africville now. You really, I hope the viewers, hope you enjoyed talking to Elaine as much as I did. Definitely we'll have to do this again and we'll have to do a follow-up. Sure, I would hope, love to. And I hope to see you featured in more books or I'm looking forward to your own books coming out at some point. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> I, feel, I, I thought about that many, many times. Well, I definitely think it's something you should do. I feel yeah. your story is one that people would want to listen to. Yeah, 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 but again, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And yeah. I really enjoyed the opportunity yeah, that yeah. you allowed me to interview yeah. you. Thank you, and I appreciate you doing this. Well, Elaine, do you mind if I give you a hug? No problem. Well, Good. thanks for coming in. Well, thank you for having me. Elaine, thank I really appreciate you letting me interview you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>
say something, Angel? I would like to thank everyone for actually being here, and this is quite exciting for me. This is really huge, so if you would like to take a walk with me through Akronville, it's something really spectacular. Um, I am last year's scholarship recipient, and I am also working at the museum this summer. Uh, both opportunities have been such a blessing, um, but none of them would be possible without my wonderful grandmother, Elaine Wright. Uh, Nanny, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Nanny, I love you so much, and I thank you for your constant love and support. Uh, without you, none of this would be possible. So thank you, yes. Bill, tell us about your family roots in Africa, Bill. Um, so I'm a car free. <laughs> I'm sure all of you know me by now. Um, my dad is Chuck, you all know him. Uh, and my grandmother, Myrtle. And all my aunts and uncles, um, I just have always been a part of Africa. It's, it's always been where I identified as my home. So Amanda, years ago, you started taking pictures of people during the reunion. Why, why did you start doing that? How and why? So I take photography. Uh, I, I take photos of people. And I just wanted to give back to my community. And so I offered up the skill that I have. <laughs> um, but it's. It kind of like was lost on me at first that uh, it could be so important uh, that we aren't documenting our elders and um, we're not getting their stories and, and hearing what their lives are like. Like we have this, these, these folks who are living history right now and it's just like we're not bothering to, to document that. So I really um, saw an importance in like getting the photographs. It's really important to me, so I'm always here to document all my elders from Africa for free anytime. You can call me. <laughs> um, but yeah, everybody was, was willing and, and came and shared and just had lots of laughs. It was the best experience ever. Honestly, if I didn't even have the book process, like just sitting with folks, hearing their stories, hearing the laughter, that was enough for me. <laughs> How many people are in the room tonight that might be in the book? Is there anybody here that's in the book? I see now, so put your hand up. <laughs> Beatrice, yeah. who else? Right here. Oh, yeah. Right there. Yeah. Crystal? Yeah. Is there anything that you wished you had more time to go into for the book? Um, I think I always wish I had more time with people. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I just really enjoy sitting with people, talking, hearing these stories, and uh, getting beautiful photographs of how they tell their stories. I think that's a really important part. I wanted people to know when we're sitting around telling these stories about Africa, we're happy, we're laughing, we're full of love, and that's the Africa that we all know. So. What was the hardest part of writing this book? Finishing it, honestly. <laughs> um, it was. No, it was like a really emotional thing where I kept like, I want to go back to it and I want to read that over and edit again. I want to go back to it and listen to that story and make sure I got it right. And I want to go back and check that photo again. Like it was just, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it and I kind of didn't want it to end. I don't know. <laughs> It's one of those things you never know when it ends because there are so many stories and even though the Africville story has been told many times by many people in many different ways, there are also many people and many different experiences. So I'm sure it was very hard to figure out when it was actually done. Yeah, it was. And, and I mean, for all the, the stories that there are about Africville, I don't think we really have any that are by us, like that are our, our own stories of how we experience Africa. And so that was, you know, why I wanted to, to do this is um, I wanted people to see the elders that I see and see the love that I see in my community and understand that when we talk about this place, it's not all bad. There's not, a, you know, I know there are bad things around it, but we have a lot of love there. And that's the important part. So how comfortable are you talking about what you're doing next? Um, so other other folks uh, really like the idea and um, would really like a book of their own for their own community. Um, so we're now kind of taking some steps. Uh, I don't feel like it's my place to tell another community story. I told my community. 
Um, so I'm going to be looking to work with uh, youth in each community and teach them how to take photos, how to talk to their elders, and uh, hopefully we'll work out some new books for everybody. Excellent. Excellent. What was it like to work with a publisher? Errol, were you a good publisher? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, uh, from my end, you were fantastic. <laughs> what was it like for you? Oh, my dear. Okay, so first of all, before I even got to meet Earl and, Be and Bev, I, um, I, w I knew I wanted to be at Fernwood. That was like my goal. And Earl wanted it immediately. Uh, we just got moving on it, and they've been the best supports. They've done so much around uh, making sure we can give back to the community and um, took care of my elders. So, uh, you know, I always appreciate that. They're the absolute best. Um, and I really recommend everybody go buy books from them because they have a lot of good ones. <laughs> they do. Well, I hope that you guys learned something today and I hope you really enjoyed what took place, all the information. And I really appreciate that you stayed with me throughout this and went on this journey with me of enlightenment. When reading this book, I went in with the expectation of beautiful photography because I know that's what Amanda's capable of. She never fails to impress me with her ability to capture a moment. I was not disappointed at all with the beautiful images that really captured the heart and soul of Africville through the faces of its people. What I was not expecting was to be brought to Africville through the stories of all of those involved. Amanda did a really good job curating all of the stories and it had such a great flow. The book ultimately brought me to tears. Many tears were shed in the reading of this. I was in tears while still in the foreword and when I read the opening poem the tears wouldn't stop as I pictured the lives of the people of Africville, of my family, living their everyday lives. And in spite of the treatment they received from their government of whom they pay taxes to, they always were prosperous and full of joy. I was inspired but also truly saddened by the fact that I myself will never get to experience living in Africville with my family. However, just like Amanda mentions in the book, I will always be able to remember the sense of community and connection felt at the reunions. Due to COVID, we haven't been able to hold our annual reunions that we normally would have, but I can't wait until we're able to start that up again and I'm able to see everyone. It's going to be a wonderful moment. It's a part of my life that means a great deal to me. It's amazing to go camping with endless family, to see all of the beautiful faces and the multiple smiles. Seeing people you haven't seen in years, seeing people you know you'll see there each and every year, and going in right away for an extra tight hug. The feeling you get from Africville is truly a feeling of bliss. It's often referenced for its tragic destruction, which should never be forgotten. However, the stories of accomplishment, the shared feeling of safety, the endless stories of gatherings filled with laughter and music and an abundance of food are the stories that touch my heart and allow me to feel within my soul that I am Africville. Thank you for watching and please don't fight hate with more hate. You accomplish more with love. Take care. You were born in Africa, Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>